And again, I'll, I'll say welcome, Dr. Pete and Carl from Victory Sports Medicine. We really appreciate um, you guys joining us today and talking about the bear implant. Um, so I'll let you guys take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Mary, for uh, reaching out. Um, that really was uh, nice of you. And, uh, you know, as you know, we've done some uh, uh, VSM OPT uh, collaborations in the past, and we're looking forward to doing more uh, in the future. Uh, thank you, Colleen, for getting us um, hooked up here, and hopefully everybody can hear us. And thank you to all the OPT staff for um, logging in. So we're going to talk about the uh, bear implant. Um, we're going to get into that. Uh, we all know that, you know, ACL tears are mechanical and instability problems, but uh, the bigger issue with ACL tears is that they're also a biologic problem. So when the ACL tears, you know, all of us know what the ACL is. It's in the center of the knee there. It's kind of like a rope. And when that rope tears, when a rope tears, it kind of shreds and it's all kind of shredded. And then you got all that fluid inside the knee. And number one, the tissue is kind of crappy because it's all shredded. But number two, it's floating around in there and it can't meld back together as opposed to something like the MCL or an ankle ligament, for instance, which is extra articular, that type of a ligament doesn't have fluid around it. It's not inside the inside of a joint. So um, what happens normally is when a ligament tears, you get a blood clot there, it bleeds. And that blood clot forms a, a internal scab. Basically there's platelets in there. There's a fibrin clot, there's growth factors. And so all that allows the um, ligament to heal by forming a bridge there. So the ligament cells can uh, grow across the blood vessels, the nerves, all that stuff. So most MCL uh, tears are going to heal, uh, just like most ankle uh, sprains are going to heal. Um, they may heal a little bit looser, but they're still going to usually heal. Whereas the ACL, because number one, there's fluid in there and it washes away all that potential blood clot. And number two, there's enzymes, uh, proteolytic enzymes within the synovial fluid that dissolve that clot. There is no bridge. But what's interesting is that the, if you look at the ACL stumps on the tibia and on the femur, they do have cell migration. They do have collagen production. They do have cell and vessel proliferation because um, those, that ligament does want to heal. It's just, there's no bridge there for those cells and that collagen to, to, to go across. So that's kind of the problem with getting the ACL to heal. So what's the solution? Well, since ancient Greek times, people have, uh, uh, there's been stuff written about ACL tears and trying to get them to heal. Uh, fast forward to the 1970s or so, and um, orthopedic surgeons tried to, you know, make an incision, do an open uh, repair, trying to put a, a needle, a curved needle with a, a needle holder into the, the intercondylar notch, which is very narrow um, in this area. It's tough to get in there just physically to try to repair that let alone the ends are all shredded. And then even if you can sew it together, the fluid in there and the proteolytic enzymes still wash away that bridge. So um, Dr. Martha Murray and her team at the uh, Boston Children's uh, in uh, Boston, um, she's been researching this for at least 15 years or so. And um, she knew that if we could somehow create the same environment that that MCL undergoes, um, there's cell migration, there's collagen production, all that thing. If we can just create a bridge that can stay there for a long enough period of time, perhaps we can get the ACL to heal. Uh, people have tried putting a sheath around it. People have tried injecting stem cells, all kinds of different things. But her solution and her team's solution was to, to build a bridge that uh, optimally can allow that uh, ligament to, to the ends of the ligament to grow back across and heal. So what would the ideal bridge be? Well, first of all, it would resist that fluid, that synovial degradation that occurs from those proteolytic enzymes. And then it wouldn't stay there forever. You'd want that to go away eventually so the ligament can replace it. So you want it to be like a scaffold that will slowly resorb over time. You want it to be safe. You don't want there to be any disease transmission, no reactions, no rejections. And then you want it to be an ideal scaffold so that cells will migrate to it and they'll proliferate. You'll get vascularization and also nerves to grow back across there. So what did they come up with? Yes, they came up with using uh, type one bovine collagen. So yeah, that is from a cow, but in medicine and in orthopedics, we use xenografts for many things. Um, we use bovine. We also use um, uh, pig 
um, tissue at times. So this purified bovine collagen, I even use for rotator cuff repairs. There's a quote unquote patch that we put over the repair or even a partial tear. And it acts like a scaffold and the new tendon cells grow into it and it thickens up the tendon and helps things heal faster. Well, same principle here. Uh, type one bovine collagen is very hemostatic, meaning that platelets love to aggravate and, and attach to it. And once the platelets um, attach to it, they activate. And when they activate, they release growth factors and those growth factors stimulate new blood vessels and cells to come in the area, which helps things heal. That's how PRP works basically. Um, the bovine cartilage is also resistant to plasma degradation, but it will resorb over time. And what's cool about it is the resorption rate is very similar to the rate of healing. So it's going to resorb uh, at the same rate that it's healing. And uh, if you look over to the right or by eight weeks, um, it should be completely uh, resorbed. So what they do with it is they process it. So there's no antigens, there's no chemical uh cross-linking. Um, they make sure there's no uh, bacterial, viral contaminants, things like that. So it's basically just pure collagen. It's a pure collagen scaffold. And then they shaped it into, it looks like a cylindrical shape here on the right. And it almost looks like the size of two or three um, small uh, marshmallows stacked together. And it's almost the consistency of, um, of styrofoam uh, and it's porous. And it's kind of brittle when you first touch it. it kind of surprised me the first time I, I handled one, but it's very hydrophilic. So what it does is when you inject blood into it or rub blood on it, 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 it very much absorbs that blood. It becomes more malleable. And then it basically forms a, a kind of a bloody snot and, and, a, and a nice bridge for um, cells to migrate into and grow across and then slowly uh, resorb over time. So this is what it looks like once it's been hydrated with blood. It kind of, if anybody's taking care of wrestlers or a wrestling meat and you know they get a bloody nose, you shove one of those uh, cotton um, nasal tampons up the nose and that's kind of what it looks like. So it absorbs the blood and it acts like a blood clot, but it stays there um, and it stays there for at least eight weeks. And that allows enough time for those two ends of the ACL to grow across that bridge and heal. Um, and it resists that synovial enzyme degradation. So that's why it lasts for about eight weeks. Um, now, um, what's important is the native cells grow into it because it's a scaffold. Collagen is laid down. New blood vessels will grow into it and cross it. And I think from a PT standpoint or rehab standpoint, those proprioceptive nerve fibers grow into it. So it's going to feel more normal. It's going to feel it's going to have a normal nerve supply as well. So over time, it, it remodels and it becomes stronger. So the actual bear procedure from a surgical standpoint, I'll show a video in a minute too, uh, uh, showing some of that. But basically, you have to have at least a tibial stump. Hopefully, you guys can see my cursor here. But I'm pointing to the right hand of the screen on the knee model here. These little purple things are st stitches, sutures, that we're able to um, go um, uh, suture across back and forth to get a nice bite on that tibial stump. Those are called the tibial stump sutures. That makes sense, right? So we have this nice... Um, suture passer that we use on shoulder rotator cuff repairs, which goes into a very tight space. So that, that intercondylar notch is very tight and we're able to get it in there. It's way easier than trying to, to, to suture by hand. So we use this instrument, we're able to pass those sutures through. We drill a much um, smaller tunnel than you would drill with an ACL reconstruction. In ACL reconstruction, we might drill a femoral and a tibial tunnel of 10 or 11 millimeters, which is pretty big. These are about 2.5 at the most 3.5 millimeters because all you got to do is bring the sutures through them. So this tibial suture is going to come up through this femoral smaller tunnel, and it's going to tie over a button right here. Um, eventually, we'll tie it and tighten it up once we get the um, bridge in place. And you can't see where the femoral attachment is, but that's up in here in deep inside the notch. And so it's going to pull uh, the tibial stump up into the um, bridge uh, implant, which is right up against the femoral uh, stump. And then you also have these green sutures here, okay, that are tied to this button and this button. So they go basically right across where the ACL would go um, or where it goes, because it's still there. We don't get rid of it like we would with a reconstruction and it acts like an internal brace. So these sutures will eventually, um, uh, they're, they're temporary reinforcement while this uh, ligament heals um, and eventually they'll break and go away and they're not needed, but they're there as a temporary internal brace 
to allow the, the knee to stay in the right position while that um, ligament is healing. So uh, BEAR stands for Bridge Enhanced ACL Restoration. I think originally it was repair. Lindsay and Nicole can, um, can comment on that later, but not that it makes a huge difference. But when you see some of the literature, some of it says Bridge Enhanced ACL Repair, some says restoration. Basically, it's a repair that's restoring everything. You're restoring the cells, the blood vessels, the nerve fibers, um, the collagen, the attachment points, most importantly. I mean, we talk about where are we going to drill the tunnels when we do an ACL reconstruction and no one ever drills them perfectly. We think we do, but we don't. And with this, it's great because your attachment points are already there. You don't have to worry about where you're going to drill the attachment point. They're still there. So that's what really is amazing about this is you're getting an anatomic uh, reconstruction. I'm going to show a video here that kind of talks about this. It'll be a little choppy on your end, on, but you should be able to get the gist here. An ACL tear can be a serious sports injury. Patients often require invasive surgery and face a high risk of arthritis developing in the injured knee within 20 years of surgery. Because the ACL is different from other ligaments which can heal on their own, the current treatment is ACL reconstruction a surgeon must remove the torn ACL and replace it with a tendon graft. ACL reconstruction is a good option for many patients, but if the ACL could repair itself, patients wouldn't have to also recover from having a graft taken. At Boston Children's Hospital, Dr. Martha Murray and her team may have found the answer. Bridge Enhanced ACL Repair is a game-changing new procedure that stimulates a torn ACL to heal itself eliminating the need for a tendon graft. First, the surgeon places sutures to stabilize the ACL and the knee. A sponge made of special proteins is placed into the gap between the ends of the ACL, providing a bridge for the ligament to grow into. After the bridge is in place, blood is drawn from the patient. This is added to the sponge, creating an environment for a clot to form, jump-starting the healing process. The surgeon then uses the sutures to pull the torn ends of the ACL into the sponge. Over the next six to eight weeks, the ends of the torn ACL grow into the sponge. They reconnect and the healing tissue replaces the sponge. Early clinical trial results from this innovative procedure suggest the repaired ACL may work as well as one reconstructed with a graft. Researchers hope Bridge enhanced ACL repair will decrease the time it takes to regain strength after ACL surgery and possibly reduce the long-term risk of arthritis in the injured knee. So that, um, hopefully that came through okay for you guys. Um, and that's pretty close to how it's done. We actually hydrate the blood into the, into the implant before we put it in. Uh, and the reason I say that is because if any of you guys do want to come to the OR and watch, I mean, Carl watched us do the first one that we did. And we always have students come in the OR, et cetera. So if you send someone and you wanna come watch the surgery, you know, feel free, we can get it set up to get you to come in and watch it. So, all right, what are the, does this work and what are the clinical benefits? I mean, we know the theoretical benefits, you're basically repairing or regrowing uh, and restoring the native ACL. I mean, that's awesome. If we can do it, that's the holy grail. So um, it does, restore that native ACL. And uh, there um, are originally two uh, level one studies, randomized uh, controlled uh, blinded studies that uh, showed this, the BEAR1 and BEAR2 trials, which I'm gonna talk about. There's more um, studies that are still going on, but basically what's really cool is in the BEAR trials, okay, uh, what they did was they showed that the ACL actually did heal uh, by MRI and also by feeling it and all the, a bunch of other tests. But um, I remember watching, what got me really interested in this is I always kind of followed Dr. Murray, but I remember watching the video of her seeing the first patient they ever did with this. Okay, and she showed the ACL. So this is, I don't know if you can see this, hopefully you can see my cursor. This is the femur, this is the tibia, this is the patella, so the anterior, posterior. Ligaments are black. So this is the PCL, the posterior cruciate ligament, okay? The ACL should be coming all the way across here. Cruciate means cross, okay? They cross each other. So here's the stump of the ACL on the tibia. So this one is ideal for doing a bare procedure on because it has a good stump. You want at least a centimeter stump here. So the procedure was done three months out. Uh, it doesn't look black, it looks kind of grayish. Well, that's normal. There's a lot of edema, there's a lot of blood supply, et cetera. But what's amazing is at 12 months out, 
And I remember her looking at an MRI of either six or 12 months out. And this ligament looks just like a normal ACL. It's black. It's in the perfect orientation because you didn't have to make up. Um, you didn't have to make up uh, where you're going to do the attachment points by your tunnels. It's already, already there for you. You just had to put something in between, keep it there to let it heal. So this is a normal looking MRI. What they also found was they compared the patients that had the bare procedure to the opposite knee of that same patient. And what they found was not only did it heal, but it healed with the same exact red cross-sectional area as the contralateral knee. These are just two examples. And then the absolute perfect orientation, because again, you're preserving your attachment points. We're not making up tunnel locations and trying to make sure we get it in the right spot, which we have to do with an ACL reconstruction. And again, which we do most of the time, but we definitely don't do perfectly. This, you, you, they had their, anat you know, their anatomies there. You're just reattaching it, uh, the ends together. So it's no surprise that if, if it heals, it's gonna heal looking like this, normal. So, okay, so we know it heals, so that's awesome. And now what are the results? So how do the patients feel? So the IKDC, International D Documentation Committee, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with that questionnaire. If you're not, basically 100 is, a score of 100 is no symptoms whatsoever, totally normal knee. Um, anything above an 80 is pretty darn good. Um, and you know, if you take a whole age range of people, not you're not gonna have, even if they're 20 years old, you're not gonna have 100. Not everybody's gonna have a normal knee. So the, they compared the ACL reconstruction control group um, with the bear group, the repair group, because they, they did, they randomize them into either a reconstruction or a repair. And basically the results were the same uh, as, as an age match uh, normal. So we know the, the bear procedure compares to ACL reconstruction. Um, we also looked at, um, they looked at the laxity and basically anything under two millimeters of laxity on a KT 1000 or KT 2000 is considered normal. Um, the uninjured knees were about one. The ACL reconstruction was less than two, 1.8. The bear was 1.6, basically the same. Um, uh, honestly, you know, if you, you guys have rehabbed a bunch of ACLs, if you do a Lachman on the normal knee and a Lachman, you know, 12 months out on an ACL reconstruction, most, not all, but most do have a tiny bit more laxity than the uninjured um, knee. So it's not surprising, maybe just a tiny bit more laxity, but very comparable basically the same as an ACL reconstruction. So that, that those basically show, hey, it's not worse. Uh, it's at least comparable to an ACL reconstruction, but is it better? Are there things that actually make it better? Well, there are definitely things that make it better. One is uh, the bare patients had superior hamstring to quadriceps ratio. And we all know the hamstring protects the ACL. Uh, they had that at both six and 12 months. They had superior acoustics on knee, uh, osteoarthritis, outcome score, pain, um, and so basically pain score. So they had less pain and um, their knee felt better than the patients who had the ACL reconstruction. And then they also had a superior return to sport index at six months, even further out too, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so they returned to sport uh, quicker and more of them returned to sport. And this is the bear too, the second uh, tri trial, which had more patients in it. And uh, it, I think it even shows uh, more so by pie charts here that basically what it's trying to show is the bare implant versus the ACL reconstruction patients. The bare patients tended to have better scores, higher. Remember, anything over an 80 is pretty darn good. So 75% had greater than 80 and 40% had greater than 90, which is really, really good. Whereas the ACL reconstruction, 11% had greater than 90 and about half of them had uh, less than or equal to 79. So if they felt more confident in, in their knee and had less pain, um, more they were more likely to get back to sports as well. Because uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, why patients a lot of times don't get back to sports. They don't feel confident in that knee, that reconstruction. Um, another thing that I'll talk to patients about is when you're gonna do an ACL reconstruction, um, they'll ask, well, what's the chances of me re-tearing this? Can I re-tear it? Well, absolutely, you can re-tear it. And if you're going to go back playing soccer, volleyball, football, yeah, there's definitely a chance you could re-tear it. Uh, hopefully, it's relatively low. But in general, it's probably 10 to 15%, especially uh, more so in younger females. And the younger the patients are, the more likely they are to fail and re-tear. So 10 to 15% failure rate, kind of all comers. But if you look at these particular studies here, um, what I tell patients is 
uh, you know, yeah, you're, 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 you have a chance of re-tearing your ACL, but you actually have just as much, if not more, a chance of tearing your opposite knee. And they always kind of get freaked out about that. We don't know exactly why that is. Um, and we have some theories and every, I'm sure you guys all have theories too. No one knows hundred percent why that's true. Some of it definitely has to do with you lose proprioception in that ACL reconstructed knee because you're drilling right through those attachment points. Um, you know, the, the origin and insertion points, and that's where all the nerves and blood vessels are. You're putting a hunk of dead tendon in there. Yes. It's alive when you harvest the hamstring, the quad, the patellar tendon, but when you take it out and put it into it, into a tunnel, it's dead. It has to revascularize has to re neuralize and it never the, the the proprioceptive nerve fibers never get back to normal again so that's kind of one of the things you know maybe the opposite knee is trying to compensate for that acl reconstructed knee which may make it a little higher risk of, of tearing but what they found was um in the bare patients maybe because their knee felt more normal maybe because the proprioception was better um maybe because the attachment points were perfect um had less rate of tearing their opposite acl so maybe they weren't relying, you know, or compensating as much for the knee that was uh, repaired. Um, now this slide, we probably don't even need because I know at Victory Sports Medicine and at OPT, zero patients get arthrofibrosis because you guys are all awesome PTs. And I always tell patients um, the biggest correlation with post-op um, uh, function is, uh, or post-op motion is pre-op motion. So we always try to get that back ahead of time. And I always tell them, you know, the surgery is important, but uh, the PT is just as important, if not more important, because you're with me for a couple hours. You're with your therapist for months. And by the way, Joe Burrow, kudos if you saw, he he uh, he, he gave a shout out to his therapist after uh, they, they got to the Super Bowl, just so everybody knows. Um, and anyway, arthrofibrosis, 4% to 35% in the literature. If anybody's getting 35%, they're either really bad surgeon, really bad physical therapist, or they're not doing any therapy. But it happens. I mean, some people lose some range of motion. Interestingly, bear one, bear two, nobody lost any range of motion or had any arthrofibrosis, whereas the control ACL reconstruction groups in bear one and bear two had anywhere between 5.7% to 20% loss of range of motion arthrofibrosis. And the MOON trial is just a huge multi-center ACL reconstruction trial that was published. Um, and that the average rate of arthrofibrosis was about 4.7%. So um, very interesting. Uh, it's a less invasive procedure. There's not, a, we're not drilling huge tunnels where all this blood and, and stuff has come into the knee. You're, you got less, I mean, it's still painful. You're still doing surgery, but um, I think you have less incidence of scar forming. So it doesn't surprise me that these were the results that were found. Um, also, um, another thing is if you have an ACL reconstruction and let's say you're one of those unfortunate 10 to 15 percent who fail your only option is an acl reconstruction revision and we all know that revisions don't do as well as primaries and this slide to the left shows that the ik uh, dc uh, scores were uh, on average 77 for an acl revision you know after an acl reconstruction however we also know that um you know the bear uh surgeries also had a similar rate of failure so it wasn't worse it was similar to ACL reconstruction. But what's interesting is if you're one of those unfortunate people who tears your bear um, procedure or re-tears your ACL after a bear procedure and you need an ACL reconstruction, you actually are going to behave just like a primary ACL reconstruction in that your, your uh, subjective scores are going to be just as high as an ACL or reconstruction or higher or just as high as a benchmark. And your your um, stability scores are going to be just as good. Now, this doesn't show the um, what your stability is from an ACL reconstruction revision, but I know for a fact, and some study other studies have shown you have more laxity. You just don't do as well. So it's pretty cool. You're not burning any bridges if you get the bare procedure, and on, and if it fails, um, you still can basically get a primary ACL reconstruction. Is what this is showing. So why wouldn't you want to do it? I have no idea why you wouldn't, but that's an op that's what we'll all encounter when we talk about this with patients and what I already have been encountering. But another thing that patients love to ask is, you know, or their parents, hey, you know, um, you know, what's the chances of getting back to playing at whatever level out they were at before, or they want to, you know, go to college or they want to become a professional, et cetera. Um, what's the chances? So what they found in the Bear 2 trial was that 80 86% 80 
of the bear patients returned to pivoting sports at one year, while only 70% of ACL reconstruction patients returned to pivoting sports at one year. Um, and that actually the moon trial, the big huge moon trial also had about 70%. And of that 30% that didn't, the biggest reason they, they stated that they didn't get back was not necessarily that they tore their ACL or, or again or whatever, they just didn't feel confident and it didn't feel normal. So again, that proprioceptive thing may have something to do with it. Another thing that we know is that when someone tears their ACL, uh, you know, pretty much they guarantee they've got a much higher risk of developing arthritis down the road. We know that about 50% of all ACL tear injured knees develop osteoarthritis within five to 15 years. What's interesting is we also know that ACL reconstruction, while it does, you know, most of the time prevent instability and allow people to get back to sports and function, et cetera, um, it doesn't prevent arthritis. We know this, we've known this for a long time, and that is part of the dilemma of ACL reconstruction. So 50% of patients who undergo ACL reconstruction still develop osteoarthritis within 12 to 14 years. So it doesn't prevent, ACL reconstruction does not prevent osteoarthritis. Well, what did the, what did the um, bear uh, study show? Well, they're looking at um, six and 10 year follow-ups. Well, the first patient who ever had a bear procedure is about six and a half years out. So they don't have any 10 year follow-ups yet. Um, and uh, uh, I'll probably shouldn't say it, but it looks like the five or six year, year ones are trending toward not having as much arthritis as the ACL reconstructions. However, we do know if you look at pigs here, they did do a study on pigs and they took three groups of pigs. So the, to the left here, they just um, cut the ACL and let the pigs go run wild. Then in the middle, they cut the ACL and they did an ACL reconstruction. And on the right-hand side, they cut the ACL and then they did a bear procedure. After 14 weeks, they sacrificed the pigs and they had a big barbecue. And what they found when they looked at the knees was that on the uh, ACL, um, the, the, just the ACL was just cut. They developed arthritis after 14 weeks, pretty much what we would have thought. ACL reconstruction, no different than humans. They also developed arthritis. But what was very interesting was that the bear procedure did not develop arthritis um, after 14 weeks. So we're hopeful and the trend, it's trending towards that is what's going to happen in humans. The only thing is that that barbecue, the bear um, pigs did not taste as good because they were too muscular. They didn't have enough fat, just so you know. Anyway, uh, the final uh, slide that I have, then I'll let Carl take over, um, is that this is just what the, the studies I was talking about. Bear one was initially 20 patients, bear two, 100, and now there's bear three, and there's another multi-center study going on, which is going to have a lot more patients in it. So we'll have a lot more answers, but I think we already have a lot of really good answers that I just went over. I'm gonna let Carl talk about the rehab and uh, then I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Um, and now I want a BLT for lunch, just so you know. Oh yeah, bacon. All right. So um, as you guys know, um, you know, Doc is a big proponent of PT. I kind of alluded to that uh, you know, during his talk. So. Um, that's why we felt like you guys would be a great kind of uh, group to, to kind of work with because you guys' reputation uh, throughout the community and people we talk to is really good. So I think that's a kudos to, 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 to Loris and all of you guys as therapists and, and doing a tremendous job. So, you know, I'm really excited to look in, and looking forward to kind of working with you guys and, and working with bear patients uh, um, down the road. So, you know, the big thing you think about ACL reconstruction, you know, you think about the, the injury, you think about the length of recovery. Um, and then you think about all the secondary issues down the road, long-term, like Doc alluded to, like 50% of your patients 20 years down the road are going to have arthritis. So your 17 year old female athlete coming to you at the age of 40 is now going to be seeing you again because they have, you know, bone on bone arthritis. So when, when Doc presented this, you know, to me or showed me, you know, kind of what this was about, like I jumped right on and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of you, you know, just hearing him talk is like, wow, this is, this is amazing because it really is. I mean, this is maybe in 10 years and our hope is that this is how you treat an ACL in, in salt. So, I mean, 
uh, you know, the good thing about the bear procedure is you don't have that donor site, site morbidity. So you don't have, you know, difficulty kneeling or those hamstring deficits or those uh, quad deficits long term. You know, the, the initial research shows there's no arthrofibrosis um, compared to an ACL reconstruction where you're going to uh, potentially have those things and you're going to have to navigate that throughout the, you know, their care with you, but also long term, that's something that they're going to have to deal with. So indications for use. So these are, this is for uh, skeletally mature individuals, 14 years or older, um, that had a complete rupture of the ACL. And like Doc said, you, they have to have that stump. Um, I think it's like 58 millimeters. Doc, you can let me know if I'm off by any bit there. But um, so who is it good for? It, it's good for anyone that literally had a ACL uh, rupture with you know, that tibial stump. It doesn't matter if they're under 18 and they're doing outdoor activities or high level, or if they're over and they're collegiate athlete, professional athlete, or even, you know, our, our labors, they're all um, a candidate for this procedure because, you know, if, if you can repair it, in my opinion, in Doc's opinion, um, it should be repaired. Uh, so the things we need to talk about with, with the patients that do decide to go undergo this procedure is this is not reconstruction. Um, the rehab is not the same early on. Uh, the outcome times are, are pretty comparable to an ACL reconstruction time. You know, uh, it, from the research, that nine month mark to 12 month mark is typical when you'd see return to sport with the least likelihood of, of re rupture. So, and that's right in line with. Um, reconstructions as well. So, you know, early on the, the rehab, because you're regrowing an ACL is going to be a bit slower. So um, I know personally, I've had to kind of pump the brakes and um, kind of stay within myself and what the, what the protocol is. Um, obviously, if you look at the, the research, the high quality research at that, um, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So uh, really got to stay, stay with this protocol. That's huge. You know, you can't start to progress them past those time frames at this point. Um, as much as, you know, as PT, we want to kind of get them there as quick as we can, as safely as we can. Uh, it's really, really important that you kind of keep the brakes on yourself and also on the patient and, and probably most importantly, education. Uh, I can speak with, with some experience that they start feeling good um, really early compared to uh, reconstruction. Um, the one case study that we're, we'll present in, in a few here, um, you know, I think it was like two weeks in, she's like, can I go to the movies? Can I go do, can I do all this stuff? And, you know, it's winter time, it's this, you know, we really want to protect these, these individuals. So they're going to start feeling good pain wise, but that's your opportunity to educate them on the process. And obviously you don't have to go quite into depth as, as Doc did with, with the physiology and the science behind it, but they need to know that, you know, this is your body's literally making a new ACL and it's, of its natural kind of state. So um, really compliance is huge and reinforcing that consistently and, you know, using the um, MEAX consultant therapist. So obviously going through this and, and having the protocol. And like I said, following that to a T is, is going to be vital um, over the long term for these patients. Um, so weight bearing, you know, they're going to come out, they're going to be partial weight bearing uh, for the first for uh, four to six weeks, they'll be partial weight bearing. They may progress to unlocking the brace at four weeks if they have normal gait, no pain. You know they have good quad control, um, unless it's like a meniscus repair. In which case, you know obviously if you're getting you know the op report from us as well as the order, we'll, we'll indicate that and they'll they'll stay locked in that brace um, at zero for that full six weeks. Uh, possibly eight, depending on, you know, the type of tear, if it's a root tear, et cetera, it may be a bit longer, but we want to make sure you guys have all that information. So we're all on the same page. So we'll do a good job of communicating with you guys. And obviously you guys will do a, an excellent job of communicating with us. So we're all kind of doing the best for the patient, you know, uh, from our end, the patient sees, uh, Dr. Petropoli usually at the two week mark, the six week mark, three months. Um, and, and you know, depending on where they're at after that, maybe a little variable, you know, we, we have seen our, uh, the bear, uh, patients a, a little bit more frequently. We'll probably consider, uh, continue to do that just to keep a really good eye on them. Um, and, th and that way we, you guys have communication. So we're all on the same page. So, uh, these patients are going to be locked in a T-scope, uh, zero degrees of extension. Um, 
you know, I know I had a, a conversation with Kathleen at Boston Children Hospital and, and mentioned, you know, do we put them in hyperextension or extension? And, and she was uh, pretty straight with me that they, they just recommend put, keeping them right at zero. So you're not putting them in a negative 10 degrees of extension at T-scope brace. Um, and they're really only going to be unlocking that, that brace for range of motion. And it's going to be structured over a six week period to get them to, to a 90 degree um, bend. Um, and then, you know, like I alluded to, as long as they have good quad control, they look good, right? Anything you would normally do with your patients that post op, they have to obviously look good before you take that next stop. And obviously it's just as important, probably a little bit more important, these uh, aspects that you don't kind of cut corners and allow them to sneak by with a little bit of extensor lag or, you know, a little dynamic valgus with gait. We really want this to be crisp and, and it to look clean. Um, so what, what's recommended is there's no scar tissue uh, massage for the first six weeks. Um, there's never any passive motion into flexion. Um, so, you know, heel slides with a strap, we're not doing, they're actively going to be getting that range of motion. We don't want to stress uh, the motion and, um, as a PT, when I heard that, I, I was a bit concerned as I'm assuming some of you are like, you know, we got to get that motion back, right? But I can tell you from, from you know, going through the process, it's, it's amazing how it, it comes back after you take the restrictions off and the patients are able to actively get it. So um, that's, that's going to be a big difference between a normal ACL reconstruction. Driving, uh, if uh, they're, uh, you know, of driving age and the you know teenage athlete generally they'll be starting to ask driving questions probably sooner rather than later so we want them off the medications and no narcotics um, and if it is that right leg no driving for the first six weeks and they need to be easily uh, able to achieve 90 degrees of flexion um, in the populations that have you know physical labor jobs we really want to keep the restrictions on these pa these patients this is you know early on this is not something that we want to screw up and, and, and uh, have them, you know, have a graph that fails for them because of, you know, work issues, et cetera. Um, the only modality that, uh, that is recommended is neuromuscular uh, re-ed on the quad. Um, and at this point, they have not done any research to my knowledge on, on blood flow restriction training. So um, they do not, we do not want that to be done with these patients at that point or at any point. Um, so your job as a therapist early on is to educate, talk about those progressions, uh, gait progressions with the, with the uh, patient, and then you know if you need to at that six week, um, you can start some uh, some post op. And obviously, with running, they're going to be cleared by the surgeon to do so by doc. Um, usually, at least the eighteen week mark before they're even starting to run. But obviously, they got to check a bunch of boxes along the way. So this is the motion that I was talking about early on, uh, fairly restrictive, but think about it restrictive for a reason, right? So zero to two weeks, uh, they're going to, to, to zero to 30 degrees. They can unlock the brace and I'll show a picture of how they're going to do it. They're just going to do it seated active uh, knee flexion exercise. You know, one of the things that Doc and I talked about is, you know, do we get tricky and we, do we increase it to zero to one week? They're at 15 and, you know, zero uh, to two weeks, they're going to 30 and et cetera, all the way to that 90. So we're not just kind of opening them up, you know, from 60 to 90 in two weeks, and they're kind of gradually getting there. Um, so that's something to consider as well. And don't force it. Um, if they're not getting there, just reinforce frequency and at that point, and, and, and they will get there. Um, I can say that for sure, uh, based on the research and experience. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure, you know, we're, we're, they're going to have swelling, they're going to have edema, um, they're going to be locked in extension, and, and that flexion, like I alluded to, is going to be variable um, at that point. You know, early on, we just want to make sure there's no signs of infection, none of that stuff, no DVD, blood clots. Um, they don't I'd really advise um, any real PT, formal PT starting it until four weeks, um, and your first PT visits usually going to be about week two. You know, I, I will say that, you uh, we normally see our patients the day afterwards. So if they're coming to you, they'll have a big gauze wrap and ACE wrap on locked in a T-scope and we clean them up and educate them once again for that stuff. So there'll be that. And, you know, in my opinion, if the patient gets benefit from it, you're not going to be able to do it, able to do a lot with a patient, but sometimes in this, this stage is the education and that reassurance is probably the best thing you can do for these patients. Uh, even if it's a, regular reconstruction. Obviously, you can do more with a reconstruction. 
Um, so obviously from you guys, this uh, front end is going to make sure that you have the orders, the app report, and and uh, and the insurance is verified. Um, and then you'll give them the home exercise program at that two week that they can begin. And this is it. So essentially they can do like a, a sustained extension uh, either with like a prop at the heel or on a chair. And, and then at that point they can start, uh, you know, the knee flexion. So that zero to two weeks, they're going to go to 30, uh, two weeks to four weeks to 60. And they can also at that point, at that two week mark, start that quad set. If you don't see a good quad set, uh, you can start uh, neuromuscular uh, stim at that point. Uh, they can also uh, start toe raises, heel raises with upper extremity assistance. Um, and this is essentially just what I went over. This will be what you'll see in the protocol when you get it. Um, you can begin your patellar mobilizations at week two um, and you're using your ice early on. You've educated them about the importance of ice and utilizing that to get the swelling down. Um, so our goal is to get full knee extension, um, get some get good quad uh, activation um, and, and really minimize the pain and the swelling. I'll be honest with you, at the four week mark, they're generally feeling pretty good. Um, this is the point where you can start, you know, unlocking the brace, working on gait, as long as they have good quad control and able to do, you know, 20 straight leg raises without a lag. Um, and if that's a, a meniscus repair, we're gonna leave them locked in for another, uh, another two weeks at least. Um, and Doc will have a, a visit with them before to kind of clear them to unlock the brace to start walking at that point. So here, here's kind of the staples of kind of that uh, phase two, you know, you're working on range of motion, quad control, swelling reduction, um, and the patient should achieve full extension. It shouldn't be hard. I mean, they're locked in extension majority of part of their day. Um, and the flexion, you know, at that phase, you should be about 60 degrees working towards 90 degrees, but there is gonna be some variability. Um, and then you're working on your stair negotiation as well in this time frame. So as we move on through this, the phase three is going to be more towards that seven to 12 uh, week period. Uh, so they got to get to zero to 110 degrees of flexion is the goal. At that point, we switch from like a T-scope to more of a functional ACL brace. Um, and they should be wearing that at any time they're out moving around, especially when they're doing their exercises, et cetera. Um, as at this stage, you can start doing like some sideline hip abduction, you can still use your enemy asset if needed at this point. Um, and, and you can be a little bit uh, more aggressive with longer duration holds with knee extension um, and then working on uh, knee flexion with either wall slides or active heel slides um, and then active assisted kind of knee flexion. But once again, no, no passive range of motion um, during this whole process. And at, at eight weeks, they can start to aqua jog. Um, and this kind of reinforces kind of what we talked about with, you know, multiple times weight bearing status, the brace, um, you know, you want to start to kind of increasing, um, you know, proximal distal hamstring uh, musculature at this point. Um, so this is essentially the same thing, incorporating more different, different ways of, of flexing the knee. You're doing your four-way uh, SLRs, really trying to keep as much quad strength as you can, limiting atrophy, um, as well as hitting those hamstrings um, as well. So your criteria is, you know, 20 straight leg raises without a lot, without a lag. Um, I'll be honest, I, I, I kind of, I prefer, I go up to 50 here just because, you know, I think they should be able to do that before I get them out of the brace. I want to make sure they're good. All right. So now, you know, at that 12 week, that three month mark, now we can start to have a bit more fun with these patients. Um, they're going to be doing a little bit more resistant exercises, swimming with some flutter kicks. I don't know if you guys have like uh, aquatics or anything in your guys's, uh, any of your clinics, but that would be something um, that they could implement. You know, they're working on the bike, the elliptical, the Stairmaster uh, at that start, uh, at that 12 week mark. So Carl, we do have, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We do have aquatics in our Liverpool location. Oh, cool. Yeah, that would be, uh, you know, that would be something maybe those patients, you know, once a week would be willing to go over there and, you know, uh, you know, get in the pool and, and work on some of this stuff. I think that would honestly be super advantageous for them. Um, so that's good to know. Um, at this phase, you're going to be starting your mini squats. You really don't want your knees over your toes. 
Um, you want to keep good alignment. Obviously, you're, you're, you're doing what you normally would do as clinicians and keep in form, uh, not avoiding that dynamic valgus and, and that good quad control. Um, you know, to get to stage five at this, you know, from, you know, 20 weeks plus, our goal is full range of motion, get that swelling, that effusion out of there. Um, and they have to obviously have to be at least 20 weeks out. So if they're, you know, two weeks, at three weeks ahead of time, you can't just move to that phase five. You got to really allow, you know, the body to, to do what it's doing by, by recreating that ACL. Um, so, you know, in this phase at 12 to 20, you, you know, you're starting your single leg sit to stand. So you have some support. So they're not just doing like a single leg squat. You're getting your single leg control with your step ups, your, your single leg deadlifts, your, you know, your glute work. And obviously you're adding uh, more dynamic stretching at this point and a little bit of neuromuscular control. Um, and as you know, after that 20 to 30 week, or after that 20 week mark, excuse me, you know, you're, you're moving more towards your strength training parameters, squats, deadlifts, you know, shuttle runs, sports cords, uh, all that fun stuff that I'm assuming if you're on this call that you really, really like doing. Um, so it just takes a little longer potentially to get there. Uh, but once you get there, um, you know, it, it shows that the outcome is going to be the same for you. So uh, they're going to start straight line running at, at least after 18 weeks, probably closer to 20, to be honest with you. And, uh, as time goes on, you know, you just want to look at their, um, their hop score. So they're going to be doing double leg hopping, uh, jumping, working towards hopping. Um, and then at that point you can do more formal strength testing. Um, and our goal to discharge is going to be 95% uh, with single leg hop, uh, triple hop, crossover hop, et cetera. We do a few other things in the clinic that I would love to talk to you guys about what you guys are doing. So we're all on the same page. You know, obviously we can adapt some of what you're doing and you guys can kind of maybe adapt to what we're doing. So uh, that phase six, that advanced phase, obviously insurance is dictating a lot of what we can do at this phase, probably. Um, you know, we're fortunate that uh, we have a VFIT program that a lot of our patients will hopefully switch over so we can do more of that strength and conditioning. But, you know, I know it's of my opinion and of Doc's opinion that we still want them to be formally seen in some capacity. So I, I don't know if you guys have um, any sort of like ancillary services or anything like that set up once their insurance um, kind of deems them to be functionally uh, where they need to be. Um, but this, that's something we do. So um, we can talk about that and, you know, maybe they need to switch to us if you guys don't at that point, et cetera. Um, and at this point, you're just progressing over time. Time is the, the component and probably the most important uh, component at this time obviously with good quality control with everything we're doing, you know, you're, you know, at 30 to 60 weeks, you're doing multi, more multi-directional lunges, uh, more progressive loading type stuff. And your goal is to get to about 75% uh, of the contralateral limb with that hop testing. And then you finally go to that phase 36 to 52 weeks. Um, and then you're just taking everything from uh, the previous, uh, phase and you're taking it to another level and you're taking that to the sports conditioning um, and sports specific activities that you're doing. And then uh, you're looking at their <clears throat> IKDC scores, their, their hop testing and all that stuff. And, and then they'll be formally evaluated by doc to determine the readiness to go back to, to sport. So still that nine to 12 month recovery time that we would um, expect um, for an ACL reconstruction with the risk of re-injury reducing significantly, obviously after that nine month mark. So uh, doc, you wanna present uh, our case study or? All right, can you guys hear me? So Mary, in the interest of time, do you want to, um, do you want to ask questions? Do you wanna to go to questions? I mean, it, our case study is, uh, um, it won't take long, but I mean, I, I, I also want to leave time for questions. I'd, that's fine with me. Yeah, absolutely. I guess what I'll say is, does anyone have questions for them at this point? You can unmute and fire away. Maybe we'll take a few minutes and see what kind of questions we have now. And some of our staff can possibly stay on afterwards if people don't have a patient right afterwards, if we want to get into the case study as well. 
I think for myself, one question I had was you talked about the age restriction on the, the lower end. Is there a limitation in this in this protocol right now for, you know, when do you time out when it's kind of too late for you? Well, I, th I what I didn't mention was and I and uh, is that the, in the studies, um, the farthest out that one of these was done was 50 days because the um, yes, you get cell proliferation, you get vascularization, you get all those things that occur, but eventually that stops if, if the two ends can't connect and then you get atrophy. And then, you know, if you go inside someone who tore their ACL three years ago, there's nothing left. So you, it, it really, it, as far as it just depends on quality of tissue. I mean, it, it was FDA approved for that age range, but you can, as a physician, we do lots of things that are um, quote unquote off label. You just have to let the patient know that um, it's technically off label if they're under 14, for instance, or I think it, uh, Lindsay or Nicole can let, uh, chime in. Is it, what's the, what's the quote oldest uh, age? 30, was it 35? Well, yeah. I mean, it's indicated well beyond that. Sure. We're doing study, the moon study right now, the cutoff is um, well above anybody who would ever be receiving an ACL reconstruction. Um, well, I've, so I've there's done... really no, there's really no cutoff on the high end. And like Dr. P said on the low end, it is 14. Um, and anything off of the IFU needs to just needs to be discussed. Gotcha. So, yeah. So, I mean, I have done ACL reconstructions on people in their sixties. It's obviously very rare, but again, physiologically, if they look great and they have a stump on their, uh, tibia on the MRI and they, um, you know, and, and, and they are within that 50 days or it's probably that may, may end up being a little bit further out too. Cause again, it's some people at 50 days might look a lot worse than other people, but in general, that's kind of the, the general generality of it. Um, then yeah, I would, I would do it on someone of that age, uh, you know, if, if need be for sure. I'll just chime in because a, a lot of times doc, you're going to have the ability to do the graft if, if need be. Right. So like if, if, the concern may be, hey, we may or may not be able to do this, you know, proactively, they'll have the ability to, to, to create a graph. So, you know, the patient's going to know going in, like our intent is due to the bare procedure. But if it's one of those things where the outcome might not be great, if we, because of the stump, et cetera, doc will switch over to the, to the reconstruction instead. Definitely. Yep. Great, great point. Perfect. Yep. Because there we, we would never do, go there and then just say, no, we can't do it. So, we're always prepared to do an ACL reconstruction if, you know, if it's, if it's either, if there's not a stump there or it's just not the right thing, then we would just, you know, do, do the reconstruction. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. P, Gary Campbell here from the Liverpool office. Hey Gary, how you uh, doing? Good. Th I, I probably just uh, answered the question, I guess, is there a clinical significance of how close you need to get the stumps together into the, the scaffold or like, yeah. like you just kind of alluded to like, oh, this, we're, we're not going to be able to get them close enough. We just have to do the reconstruction. Well, the proceed the, that, um, that implant is, it's pretty robust. So as long as you get the two ends into it, it's going to grow across there. Cause it's going to act like that bridge. If for some reason, which would be extremely rare, um, uh, if you could not, yeah. So actually Carl's fast forwarding here. And the, the actual, that's the actual, he's showing us the actual um, implant there before it was hydrated. And it's on, it's on sutures there um, that acts like a tightrope and you push it up in there, but uh, it's, it's pretty decent size. I mean, it, it fills that notch. So as long as you got the two ends into that thing, um, you should be okay. You know, you should be okay. Um, so it'd be pretty rare. The, the rarity would be like, let's say this, there's just, you know, a millimeter or two stump, then you're not going to be able to get it up, you know, get that up into the implant. But as long as those, those two ends are touching the end, I, I'd feel pretty happy about it. Of touching the implant, I'd be pretty happy about it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Dr. P, I got a question for you here too. Sure. Uh, my name's Damon. I'm over at the uh, DeWitt Clinic here. Nice to meet you. So it seems like this is incredibly awesome where it takes away a lot of the possible human error from the graft placement, which can be really detrimental. And that's a huge, huge impact on rehab and everything else. Um, with that, is the button placement as crucial now um, or that, that um, overall, or does that not play as much as a role as long as those two um, sutures are in the right um, plane of motion? 
Yeah, the buttons are little small endo buttons, so they're pretty tiny. Um, and um, they're gonna, they're still relatively placed where you would normally have them uh, there, you know, um, so in general, I would say no, it doesn't really matter exactly where that that distal one is on the tibia and where that proximal one is on the femur, like, absolutely. But in general, they're pretty similar to where they where they, you know, would normally be. Now you can see here, you know, we made an incision here laterally to tie these down. I don't want to get out of my uh, element here, but I, I do have ideas in my head being, you know, doing a lot of shoulder arthroscopy on how to either not make an incision here or tie that without doing it. But we, you know, right now we just want to do everything exactly the way that it was done. Um, Cause the studies, like Carl said, speak for themselves. So we're not going to like go off and, and make stuff up yet. Um, I say you had, but you know, I mean, things are evolving over time and I'll, I'll, the more surgeons who get involved, I think the, probably as long as they're the right surgeons uh, in general, I think the procedure is going to evolve and continue to improve and get better and better and lesser and lesser invasive. Uh, so in better ways to put that, um, you know, put this implant in there, et cetera, et cetera. So right now it's pretty amazing the way it is, but you know, I'm, I'm excited to see how even more amazing it gets. Yeah, Dr. Absolutely. P, do you mind if I chime in real quick too? Not at all. Um, so the way that the technique is designed, just so you guys know, is like Dr. P alluded to, is when you're doing an ACL reconstruction, you really just eyeball things, right? We call them anatomic ACL reconstructions. We know that the placement is not, you know, perfect. Um, there have been a ton of studies done, and even the most perfect ones are still off or anterior by about 20, 30 to 40%. So you use the patient's native anatomy to drill your tunnels for this procedure. So you actually use their tibial stump that's left and you use whatever remnant is left on their femoral side as well. And those are your guides. So there's no approximation and you can be sure that you're drilling exactly where you need to be drilling. Yeah. And let me also say this. I mean, you're, yes, you are drilling maybe just anterior to where that, um, where that tibial stump is and maybe just off to the side of where the, the femoral stump is, but you're not drilling into and destroying the entire footprint. Really all that, all that, that internal brace is, is it's kind of just holding things together uh, while the ends of that, uh, the ligament grow across the bridge. So you really, you want to preserve the, um, the, you know, you want to really preserve the footprints and that the ligament will figure out what to do. So really the tunnels are tiny, they're small, and it's, it's, you're almost comparing an apple to an orange, to be honest with you there. Um, so uh, the tunnels are small, and we do drill tunnels, but it's not tunnels for the same reason, I guess, if that makes any sense. The one tunnel, you know, the femoral tunnel is to pull that tibial uh, cinch suture up into, pull that tibial um, stump suture up uh, and tie it so that you're pulling that tibia, uh, tibial stump into the um, bridge. And uh, then the, the both tunnels have, you know, you're putting that internal brace across there, which is going to go away in the long run. So even that, they don't have to be a thousand percent precise either. They have to be right next to where the native anatomy is. So if you have zero, if you have absolutely no stumps left on either side, then you're going to just have to do a reconstruction. Awesome. I have one more question um, real quick here. Are there any um, signs of symptoms or, or observations early on in this surgery that you would want to know right away um, if we're finding, like with the ACLR um, reconstruction stuff, if like the graph is feeling a little boggy at the end range, that's, that's probably a really good indication that maybe you need to do revision earlier on. Um, is there anything like that you guys are finding? Well, that I will leave up to Lindsay and Nicole because, uh, you know, we're only, the first one I did was uh, October 29th. So, uh, I mean, you're not going to, I, if I recall, um, I don't think we're going to do an MRI till, till she's six months out um, to see. So you, I really haven't, you, I, I've made sure no one has done a Lachman, no one's doing any type of pivot shift, no one's doing any testing whatsoever. So we don't really, you don't really know. I'm not going to lie. I took a little slight, you know, just myself the last time she was in, which was three months out and it actually very slight Lachman and it felt pretty good. It didn't feel, you know, sometimes you can tell if something's going to be loose. So I, but I didn't definitely didn't do a full Lachman, full pivot shift, anything like that. So 
I'm just, you're just letting that thing heal. And I guess you don't really know. I mean, I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? I don't, I don't really know. I can't answer that question because I don't have enough. You're not actively, you're not manually wise. You're not going to force that flexion. You're not going to be able to get that end feel that you're talking about early on. Right. So like that won't be an indicator to you because it's all patient forces for, for, for the range of motion, you know? Uh, So early on my, my gut feeling from, you know, just doing one of these is it, part of it's just trust in the process, but I'd love to hear what Lindsay and Nicole have. Yeah. To say. Tr- trust, trust the biology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I so, mean, that, go, ahead. go ahead, Nicole. No, you can go. Um, so, uh, you know, part of the answer to the question too, is we are continuing to, to look at that and look at healing ACLs on MRI. So there's a doctor out of, um, out of Harvard, um, who has worked closely with this, uh, with Martha Murray and her team of, of researchers at BCH, um, that has been looking into for a long time now, uh, MRIs of bear patients versus ACLR and looking, looking at how, how they look on MRI and can we tell, you know, um, for a patient and give more direction, maybe with, um, you know, bare implant later on, give more direction on whether or not a patient would need a little bit more time for healing versus another patient just by what, what they're seeing on MRI. So he is continuing to look at that. Um, and we're continuing to look at that, uh, right now, you know, it, it, obviously he, he has a, a pretty good idea. Um, like for example, if a, if a patient does have an event, um, say like at a three month mark or a six month mark, um, and there is question and an MRI is done. Um, you know, we are asking surgeons to consult with, um, Dr. Adakiapur, um, and looking at MRIs and, um, comparing them to ones that he's seen in the past with the bare patients that have been done so far. Um, it, just another piece of the question, but then of course, with the Lockmans and things like that, um, I think Dr. Petropoli and, 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 uh, Carl, you know, answered that. Yeah. And also I would say, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, one thing that would make us suspicious if someone was not compliant and they had a quote unquote event, right? Oh, I took my brace off. I pivoted in the shower. I felt the pop. Well then, so that's the type of thing that would make you suspicious, but just on overall physical exam, it's, you're not doing much. And like Carl said, you're not stressing it that much. So it's hard to tell. Now, this right here is an arthroscope. You can see how it's maybe, you know, four or five millimeters wide at the most right down here. Uh, can you see it, Carl? Or I, I, you're not seeing my icon or my, uh, I got control. All right. Yeah. You got control. All right. So just show, go back to the picture Yep. And you see Jordan holding that, that scope. Yeah, there's the scope. So they actually make these needle arthroscopes now that um, are very small, um, way smaller than that. And you can just look inside of a knee uh, in the office. They're obviously expensive and insurance doesn't cover it. But, um, you know, until I get more bold, I, I'm not going to talk about doing anything like that. But that would be really cool to look at, too, because even an MRI, uh, early on, it's going to look totally abnormal. Uh, you could see that three month MRI. You can't tell anything from that. It's more, you know, six months, a year, 24 months. So it'd be really interesting to just stick a needle scope in there and look really quickly at eight weeks, you know, three months up to six months, you know, whatever, and just see how it looks. But that, I, I don't think that's been done, but that's just a thought in my head that I was thinking. And thus far, every single patient that has been, that has received a bear, like Dr. Petch probably said, our first patient was just came uh, over his six year mark. Every single patient that has received a bear, their ACL has been restored. Which is there amazing. Were, there were, yeah, there was never a patient that the ACL did not heal itself back together. Um, you know, Carl also mentioned these patients are your younger patients that are your high risk patient population as it is anyway. They're going to be the ones, your 16 year old males who come in and say, I feel so good. I went snowboarding yesterday and I'm four months out from my, or four weeks out from my fair procedure. Like those are the ones that we, that, you know, we've had the biggest issue with, um, retearing or just kind of really pushing the limits because you have to remember too, they don't have a harvest site. So they don't have that scar to remind them like, Hey, you had a, an ACL done. Um, so holding your younger patients back and really letting them understand like how fortunate they are to have this procedure and they really need to just work with you and trust you as their physical therapist that you're guiding them properly, even if they feel like they don't need to listen to you. 
So I think that would be the big thing. I think, you know, we'd want to know is like, Hey, you guys did, you know, doctor the bear procedure on so-and-so and, you know, we've educated, we've told them everything that, and all this stuff. And it's like, we don't think that they're following it. Well, maybe we get them in to see doc and, you know, maybe, you know, he can reinforce to those patients that ed education, you know, that he's going to do that before surgery. He's going to do it immediately after surgery when he goes and talks to the family. And then obviously when they see you, that's, that's your opportunity to kind of reinforce. They just need consistent reinforcement over time. Um, like most of our patients, right. You know, we, we do our best to do that. I mean, how many of them listen to us? Um, I, I, I don't know. I'd like to think that the ones that undergo this will be compliant, but it's got to be constantly reinforced, I think. Well, and like, you know, as Lindsay said, you know, all of the patients who made it through uh, their, their, their ACL healed, which is amazing. So trust in the process, I guess, just try to keep trusting in it. Um, and the one other thing that I will say, so just so all of you know, um, Nicole's on our marketing side. So she's been with Miak a really long time, actually, before we commercially launched. And then we commercially launched um, really in October, but officially in December. The one thing that I will say, so I cover the um, pretty much all of New England and upstate New York. The biggest thing that I've seen, and I know that Dr. Petropoli kind of ran into this as well, as not every, you know, in, in uh, new technology, we obviously call them innovative surgeons or early adopters or whatnot. Not every surgeon is built that way. Um, I mean, you guys know there are surgeons who are doing super old school rotator cuff repairs or super old school, um, you know, ACL reconstructions or using different types of fixation. And um, so, you know, if you go to talk to a surgeon about Bear who may not be an early adopter, he's someone who will adopt this after everybody else already has, he'll he or she will, you know, they could certainly tell you, oh, there's not enough data, or I would just go with an ACL reconstruction because it, it works, right? We all know it does work. It's just that there's better options now. So as you guys work with, you know, orthopedics across different areas, um, I think everyone probably knows Dr. Petropoli to be really on the cutting edge of technology. So keep that in mind. And if you have conversations with your patients about this procedure, just you know, obviously it's up to you, however you want to direct that conversation, but just know that if they go back to a surgeon who was going to do a transtibial ACL and fixate it with titanium screws, they're probably not going to encourage the patient to get a bear done. Um, and of course, you know, we're always available to, um, I'm happy to swing by the office, leave you guys any, um, physical information that you want. Um, but I think, I think it's just important to know, cause it's something that we're running into with patients going and getting quote unquote, second opinions, and then unfortunately losing out on the opportunity to have this done. Yeah, no, I greatly appreciate that. And I, I agree what we've, we've had a lot of patients who, you know, they don't want to do it cause it's quote new Well, it's, you know, almost seven years out now. So it's really not new. Um, and you know, they want to go with the quote tried and true. Well, tried and true means you're going to get arthritis 50% of the time. So that may not necessarily be the best thing. And your knee may not feel normal. You may have a higher risk of tearing your other knee. Um, you know, you may not get back to sports uh, either as quickly or, uh, as much as someone who, you know, keeps their own ACL. Uh, if you tear, if you're one of the unfortunate people to tear that ACL graft, guess what? you get a revision and we know revisions don't do very well. So why not go with the bear? But you know, that, that I, we've definitely met resistance to that. And like Lindsay said, you know, they're like, well, we're going to go get another opinion. And then that surgeon has no clue about this procedure. And they just say, nah, it's too new. You know, you should go with the tried and true thing. Well, you just guaranteed that person a 50% chance of having arthritis down the road. Um, you know, so I don't know. I don't agree with that. I, if it was my own family, you know, or myself, Definitely, if it was Carl, I would definitely do the bear. Appreciate the elite it. athletes. <laughs> I'm more of a food athlete. <laughs> it's a good athlete. That's good to be. That's a good one. Yeah. Does anyone have any more questions for Dr. P or Carl or Lindsay, Nicole? Just keep an eye on the time. We may have to get jump off here soon for patient care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you both so very much for your time. Really. No problem. Thanks for having us. Uh, looking forward to, you know, having a great relationship. I know we already, we do, but obviously with COVID and everything in the last few years, it's been, uh, it's been tough, but I'm glad you reached back out again. And uh, I'm excited to work with you guys again. 
Yes, same here. Thank you. And remember, the offer is there to come in and watch uh, watch these surgeries. I think that'll help you a ton, you know, so. I, would, I know you I can't would, see our faces, but I'm sure the good majority of us lit right up when we heard that. <laughs> I would recommend that everyone takes that opportunity because I will, uh, I'm going to, you know, boast Dr. P here, but watching, watching him work is honestly like watching like, you know, some, you know, phenomenal pianist or violinist or whatever. He's just, or just, drummer. Or drummer. Yeah, he is a drummer. So, I mean, it's just very humbling and very amazing to watch, you know, that cool, calm demeanor and watching the process of it unfolding. And you realize like, hey, I'm treating this patient who just had, a, you know, this bare procedure, even ACL reconstruction. And the amount of work that goes into it, um, you know, it's not as easy as drilling a couple holes and sticking something in there. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing to watch. So I think everyone should take that opportunity if I can, you know, make a recommendation. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, you're making me cry, first of all. But secondly, you know, and I'll, I'll this isn't like a mutual uh, um, bromance uh, fast here. But I mean, I, I Carl's a wizard. Our whole team is. You guys are. I mean, my daughter's a PT. She just graduated from Northeastern. Um, it, you know, we, we can't do what we do without you guys. So that's why I feel and I know Dr. Andrews always felt that way. Kevin Wilk is awesome. And I learned a ton from Kevin. I, don't, I learned just as much from Kevin as I did from Dr. Andrews. So, you know, I know that you guys play, you know, a huge part in it. And uh, I appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, I guess we'll, Colleen, are we going to sign off here then as a whole? I think so. Yeah. If everyone has to jump uh, back to patient care, I recorded the whole presentation. So I'll send that to everybody and everybody at uh, Victory nice. Sports Medicine as well. So Thank you guys you. can review that. Um, and the rest of our clinical staff will watch the replay when they're able to. They're, some of them were, were sad that they weren't able to be on, but they're very excited to hear, uh, hear the presentation afterwards. Awesome. All right, and then Mary, we'll talk more about obviously, uh, you know, the next uh, next month. So we're excited for that too. Absolutely, you got it. All right, take care, guys. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. All right, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Nice job.